It's Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers with tips and advice on landscaping and gardening. Here's Fernando Martinez. Yes, indeed. I am Fernando Martinez of Chaparral Pavers right here. Uh, got my buddy and my partner with me. Jonathan Raya. Good morning, good afternoon, good day. Yes, and thanks for joining us here again on another edition of the Patio Side Chats where we give you landscaping and gardening tips and advice and let you in on our experiences and things that we go through on a on a daily basis going through landscaping out here on the central coast and i want to give you uh kind of some insight and behind the scenes and how to really make the most of your yard and your outdoor spaces today i want to talk about landscape design colors and you know, plant material, how to space things out and really think about the future, how big things are going to get. It's something that uh, Jonathan and I have been, you know, talking about and discussing when it comes to, you know, why do you place things, where you place them, why do you pick certain plants to go in that particular area? How does all this kind of tie together and incorporate with the hardscaping? And things, you know, we're not doing all these big giant lawns anymore. There's been a huge shift in change in the culture of landscaping here on on the central coast you know talk us through on some of these um, jobs we've been completing lately so lately we've been driving down neighborhoods and we'll see plants that are are overgrown mature plants and then we we kind of look at our phones and google what the expected height and width of that plant is going to be i think one of the biggest issues that we see too often in in our area here is a lot of people like to, to, to use a lot of plants and fill up an area and put them really close together so that they don't look so spaced, but they forget that those plants are going to grow. Yeah, you have to leave room for the ultimate size of that plant within a few years. You know, the way I like to say, kind of my rule of thumb is what is it going to look like in three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, even if you're not going to be there or planning on, you know, staying in their home that long, it could still help with the resale value. Nobody's going to want to buy a house with this overgrown jungle, you know, way too many plants. And so I understand the, the desire for that because I do that at my house. You know, I have, I have a tendency to overplant, but I, I love it and I do it. And if you're a true gardener and you're out there all the time, you don't mind in three, four five years taking things out, you know, I'll overplant. And, it, and it's a different style, too. Some people like that full, you know, a cottage garden where there's a lot of things, you know, um, kind of growing together and the different varieties and kind of an eclectic mix of styles. But most people, I would say 90% probably of our clients, 80 to 90%, want low maintenance. They want it clean, simple, easy to take care of, but still effective and nice and, and blooming. And a lot of the projects we go back to, I could think of a couple, we're working in San Luis Obispo right now, and, you know, we, we've done a couple of these projects about a year ago, and, and we're coming back to do some more work, and we look at the plants, and they're mature, things are blooming, it's spring, and, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I see, and I tell our clients is, man, I am blown away by the beauty of the colors and the plant sizes and how much they've spread, and I mean, it just ceases to amaze me because it's something different than when you first plant it. It looks so much bigger, more beautiful, more fuller. So it's just, uh, I love seeing that. Yeah, me too. It, it's it's exciting because when you work with plants as much as we do every day, day in, day out, you know, we it's easy to forget, you know, not, not everybody has that experience. And so when they go to the nursery or they want to take out a weekend warrior, you know, kind of project at your house. You want to freshen the yard up, get some plants out there. You really have to do the research. And and I'm glad you brought up the the whole Google thing on the phone because we have access at our fingertips now. There's no more, you know, no more excuses of, well, I didn't know, or the guy didn't tell me or the nursery guy, you just wanted to sell the plant and everything's three feet high, three feet wide, you know? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. And even as a landscaper, I've had that experience where, 
I asked the guy, you know, how how big does this get? Oh, about three feet. Oh, shoot, I was hoping it would get, you know, six feet high. Like, oh, no, that, that one does get six feet high. Like, oh. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, I so, agree. Uh, and in some cases, they're just, they're trying to get rid of something. Or, the, or you know, let's say they're good, good natured, but they didn't really, you know, they, they're trying to help a client out and... You know, it may be that they just aren't knowledgeable enough and well, and, that and happens. sometimes you do. You get misinformation or I'll look it up in books and I have the Sunset Western Garden book, which I love. And there's, you know, of course, Google and all kinds of good. There's uh, some big major nurseries here in California and they have great websites and there's Not a only lot that, of information. But you bring up a good point. Uh, sometimes it could get misconstrued because there's, there's multiple varieties of a certain plant or, you know, yeah. there's the dwarf version of the same plant. So I think a lot of hybrids are coming into the market and they're constantly changing the look, the size and, and what they're going to do. One of the things that I think about is, um, the pittosporum golf balls, yeah. Those, you know, that's, there's so many varieties of pittosporum, but the golf ball kind of stays round and low and, and it you know, looks exactly like the the nigra cans yeah when, when they're young so you, yeah i i can't even hardly tell the difference between a pittosporum that's going to eventually get you know 15 20 feet high and a golf ball that's going to stay around because the leaves are the same the stem looks exactly the same and when they're really small it's hard to tell and so like you're saying there's there's that and then there's the name variety sometimes the tags aren't on on the plant and they're hard to identify and even I have seen where you have the right variety and you look it up and you do your due diligence on Google or whatever you look in the Sunset Western Garden book and it says it gets three to four feet high. And then I plant it at my house and it gets six to seven feet high. Now let, let's talk about that because I do have some good good questions that I've, I've been asked before. And let's say we're planting... Uh, pittosporum silver sheen in the ground. We've seen how big that can get, 15 feet high. Can you regulate the growth inside of a pot? The Inside the pot, yes, because what happens is it constricts the roots. As the plant gets bigger, it kind of hits the, especially the tap root. See, plants send roots down first. They're, they're looking for water. When you first plant a plant, it sends a, like a tap root down and it's searching and it's kind of seeing what the soil is like, seeing what kind of water situation is going to be there. That's why I always tell you to deep water plants, especially when you first plant them, because it encourages that tap root to grow down. And the deeper the root system is, the more drought tolerant it's going to be, the less water it's going Can to be. Can you elaborate on deep, deep water? How would you do that? I mean, does a, a standard drip system do that for our listeners? It will. And drip systems, that's why they're so popular, because that's the best way to water. We used to have bubblers. I mean, I've been doing this uh, industry a long time, and, and the old style of watering where bubblers were putting out so much water so fast, and it was all on the surface. So what that did was it kept the surface wet by the, after two, three minutes, it's flooding out. You have to turn it off. So that encourages the roots to stay on the surface and not go down deep. So they're always looking for surface water. Drip systems do exactly the opposite of that. And they water super slow, one gallon per hour instead of a gallon per minute. And so you can leave it on 20, 30 minutes. Well, because that time, the soil has actually has time to absorb it. I always say the soil is like a sponge and when it's super dry, it hardly wants to take in water and it can actually repel water in some cases. So a lot of it will be start moving around on the top, but if you get it moist and slightly wet, similar to a sponge, and then you put more water to it, it can really soak it in. So, uh, watering slow, giving the time, the, the soil, the time to absorb the water and then you continue watering and the weight of the water and the slowness of it, it's like if you turn the hose on really slow and just leave it sit there, that's how you deep water and get those roots to go down. Now, if you stick that same plant in a pot, the taproot will go down, hit the bottom, start spinning around the pot, it'll go sideways, it'll start locking in, and they'll realize it can't grow out, and you're kind of dwarfing that plant in, in the pot, similar to a bonsai. Okay, so nice. So if you don't want something that's going to grow through your whole yard and be uncontrollable, a good way of doing that is by putting it in a pot then. Yeah. So if, if let's say you love bamboo and you want bamboo, but you know, bamboo is going to take over your whole yard. You can't yeah. plant in the ground. Pots are perfect. Awesome. If you have a, you want some giant, you know, 
bird of paradise or something or something that's going to get really big and huge and you want to keep it small, you keep it in a pot. We just had a, a couple that we were working for in Solvang and they had a couple bird of paradise in the pots. Did you see the root system? Yeah, when the we root took system them out? was already, yeah, you, you were already seeing the the roots kind of binding together. Oh my God, it was this yeah. mass of bulbs and roots, yeah. especially at the bottom is what I noticed. At the bottom two inches were solid yeah, roots. There that was, was, like, there was root, no more yeah. dirt. Yeah. And so they were trying to get out, but I told the, the client, I said, these are ready to go on the ground, you know. Now, when you're when you're doing that, you want to explain what what is a good method to, I mean, for that when the root is bound like that, you know, and it, you're planting from a pot and you're going in the ground. I, that's a great question. And there is some, I don't know if it's the, the largest controversy that we've ever <laughs> discussed, yeah. but there is two, two sides to the story because there's, once I will tell you to, to scarify the roots and yeah. rough them up and sure. kind of break them apart. My opinion, you're damaging the roots. There's just no two ways. I agree. You just about can't it. scarify it without damaging you're, you're, or cutting some of them. So what you're doing is you're trying to get those roots to spread out by you forcing it to to do that. And and I've read that as advice and people will tell you, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. I'm in the other camp of leave them alone. We just planted those birds in the ground. We didn't scarify the roots or, you know, scratch them or do anything. And I'm just going to let the plant grow out of its root bound state on its own in, in its own time. If you're in a giant hurry and you, I have to have this plant growing right away, you know, try it. But I've seen where pieces of roots can actually come off and then you plant them, you can send that plant into shock and you can actually do more harm than good, in my opinion. Okay. So in your opinion, we're saying do not scarify, I would say no, plant yeah. them in ground, let it get rid of the root bound on its own with time. Well, the best case scenario would be don't let them get root bound to begin with, you know? And well, if it's in a, in a if yeah, it's in a pot, I mean, and, you but, know, but if yeah. you're asking my advice, I would sure. say when you see a plant that's growing and been in the container more than two years, three years, four years, I mean, it's time to get, get it. The sooner, the better you can get it out of that pot into the ground. If that's what you're going to do or leave it root bound, but then you start, it takes a lot more water to water eventually. And then it becomes where you can't even keep, keep any moisture to sure. the, roots in the pot. So I'm not saying let them get root bound and then plant root bound plants because that's, that's not good for anybody. Sure. Including the plant. But if you had to don't scarify it, just let it do its thing. Those, those okay. birds are going to be fine. All right, good. So I think we, we've talked about plants, giving you a little bit of the, uh, the plant portion of this radio show. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the wall and I'm not talking about Donald Trump. Right yeah, now, you're not talking about the, the main <laughs> wall. <laughs> no, I'm talking about. You're not talking about the economy or no, I don't, no politics. Wrong show. Okay, wrong perfect, show. Perfect. Listen after this one. You, guys, maybe. you can take a break from all that and let's talk about landscaping and gardening. Yeah. So let's talk walls. I think walls are really important. They they can add a sense of beauty. They can add a planter bed for more plantings on a slope. They can add so many things. I think there's so many products out there nowadays that you can actually use for, for building walls, whether it's a freestanding or a retaining wall. Uh, right now we're on a project in San Luis Obispo, gorgeous, gorgeous view of Bishop's Peak. I mean, their, their yeah. yard is virtually, that is their backyard yeah, is Bishop's it's Peak. Beautiful. Um, so we're grabbing these beautiful boulders that were in ground and we're actually using them to build a new Retaining wall slash natural cobble rock wall. Yeah. Um, I think with this project, what's interesting is there was a pre-existing wall and the wall was not done properly. Yeah. Uh, they actually used float rock for the inside and float rock for the backyard. So the wall was losing its stability um, and they wanted to, uh, to add a hint of... of nature if you would they wanted to diminish the strong look of that wall yeah, and have something softer kind of utilitarian look with the you know kind of commercial block you know that yeah. we can get rid of that yeah and i mean and i don't blame them i think uh i think we needed to soften that up a little bit so what we wanted to go ahead and talk about today is will a wall made of different size boulders stones and rock last and stay there for the long haul does it have an aesthetic appeal in your eyes to do a wall made of just 
boulders and rock. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you hold that thought? We're going to take a quick break and get a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. If you're thinking about putting in a new paver's patio or a paver driveway, call Chaparral Pavers, 805-588-6917. The best paver installer on the Central Coast. Check out their portfolio and customer reviews online. I love to come home. Dot com. That's Chaparral Pavers, 805-588-6917. And on the web, I love to come home dot com. Okay, so we're back. And yes, you were just asking me about the thoughts on retaining walls made of boulders and cobblestones, a natural wall. Correct. And, you know, I, we have to do that in comparison to you know, either a, block, a brick and mortar wall or walls that you would put stucco on or these interlocking, you know, landscape block walls that we love and do. The difference really being like we were talking about, you get those those blocks that are kind of industrial looking. They're all the same size, very, you know, kind of stiff, um, not really warm or inviting, but they serve a, a structured purpose and they're really strong. And they And they really are because if all the blocks are the same size, and you lay them like bricks coming up and they web together. Um, they're one of the strongest walls. You can go up to about four feet on them without using any geo grid or any engineering at all, which is pretty amazing. Then you go into the, the more decorative and the tumble block and different sizes, a little bit weaker of a wall, but a lot more decorative, a lot more inviting. And you still get that same, not as str- strong of, you know, the usability of it, but maybe up to three feet I'm comfortable with on the Europa walls. And then if you go down to these natural, you know, stone and boulders and cobblestone, they're not really interlocking with each other. So I would probably maybe two feet would be the max on those. So for low walls, um, for the look, there's nothing like them. I mean, they're the most gorgeous of the three walls. It's just because you have this natural, Somehow, maybe there could have been a shelf underground there of rock and it got exposed and then there's a step down or when you have a uh, ground covery type of plants growing over the edge and then it can actually root in in between the rocks and the boulders where you, you would never be able to do that with a, you know, concrete block wall. So I would say just be careful with, with the structure of it. Make sure that you're not asking too much of a rock wall strength wise, or if you have a slope behind the wall that adds a lot of weight. Or if there's a parking space up there or anything, a shed or anything that's going to add a lot of weight that that wall is supposed to be holding back, uh, consider that before you. Yeah. And even though it's something natural and you're throwing boulders and rock back there, you still want to kind of get it engineered. So you want to know your surroundings. You want to know, is there foot traffic? Is there vehicular traffic? Right. What is it holding back? Is it just dirt? And then it goes down on the other side. I mean, those things are, are, I think, good things to know, have a know-how of what you're dealing with. You can also use mortar in the joints, too. And I've seen that as well, uh, yeah. You know, and so you're kind of creating kind of a concrete wall, but with the rocks as the face. Um, you know, so there's there's multiple ways. I would, and the other thing is, is not only thinking about the weight and the soil and the pressure and... and but drainage, you know, where's the water draining to? How is water draining out from behind the wall? And, you know, that can be end up being really important if you want that wall to be there for a long time and last. I agree. I agree. Drainage is underestimated and never overrated, in my opinion. No, yeah. You, you can never have too much drainage. There's no such thing. So that's the first thing you think of. And then... You know, the, there's elevation changes in almost every single yard. You know, it's a few people out there that are lucky to have everything flat. But even then, they want like a raised garden or some little garden wall. It's, yeah. you know. <laughs> a then, retaining wall, not retaining anything. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and so it's kind of like if you got curly hair, you want straight hair. If you have straight hair, you want curly hair. <laughs> if you have flat, you know, you want a wall. If you And then the that's why I tell people that have, they're kind of like bummed, you know, like, oh, I got this slope. I got the cost of this wall I've got to put in. And I tell them, you know, there's people with flat areas yeah. that wish they could have a decorative wall. It, it's a feature in itself. It in really my opinion. is. And especially if it's boulders and, and cobblestone, it's a, that's an amazing feature for the yard. If it's two feet high, like we were talking about, you can sit on it and, and treat it like a seat wall. 
Talking about the project that we're on now here in San Luis Obispo, if you're just tuning in, we're doing a boulder slash rock cobble wall. Uh, we're also going to do pavers. We're doing a DG path. The steps. And, and yes, some steps. Um, so one thing that we focus on a lot is not creating just a huge environment just with hardscapes. I think we need to soften it up. So what we like to try to do is we like to do percentages and, and try to mix it up, create boulders with your hardscapes, uh, such as pavers, wall steps, but also have plantings. I think it's super important. I mean, if you had to guesstimate what percentage of plantings to hardscape area needs to be done in order to really make that area pop and make it look natural? Well, I don't know. It, uh, you know, if you had it down to percentage, I don't think you want more than 70, 80% hardscape, you know, and, and without that softness, it just, it can actually detract from a, a beautiful, like, let's say you're doing a bunch of pavers back there and seat walls and a fire pit and you have all this, the house is hard, you know, and, and these areas without the softness, 20, 30% of you know, areas should be flower beds and greenery and color. Yes. Yes. And, and soften that up. And you know, if you have no choice, sometimes, you know, we went to a house over in Trilogy in Napomo and they had a, a little wall creating a courtyard and there was all concrete poured in there and the sun was beating down. It was bright and the walls of the house were a light color. I don't remember if it was white or light tan and it was just stark, you know, and one thing you could do in that case would be pottery and, have plants growing in pots on the hardscape to, to help kind of soften that up. Yeah. And that's going to add color from the pot, color from the actual plant. Absolutely. I agree. So with this, I don't think people, people know the great lengths and the extent of what it takes to make a landscape look like it was there for a hundred years. Right. I mean, like a dry Creek came out of the ground and it's been there for a hundred years. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into that. I mean, what would you say is one of the most um, hardest experiences when you're designing something like that, when you're designing a dry creek? Because this is this is something that I, th I feel is really popular right now, right. especially coming out of the drought or still being in it, but not as, as bad as we were, you know, a couple years back. What tips do you have for those trying to create their own dry creek riverbed in their back or front yard. I mean, yeah. to give it that realistic look. Well, and that's the trick. And, and you said it, it's having it look not, you know, like it could possibly become out of nature and real and not this fake, you know, the, 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 what I see a lot of is straight lines and then one size rock, you know, they'll kind of carve the, the soil out for the water to go down and then they'll line it nice and straight. And then they've got the same size rock coming all the way down very boring, very bland, all one color. That's, that's the opposite of, of nature. You know, you never, as you, what I would do, cause this is what I love and it's a passion of mine. So I would go hiking up in the hills. I went up to Yosemite. Okay. And so I'm, when I look at, at a waterfall in nature and I look at the boulders and the rocks and the trees and, and everything growing out, I think to myself, like, how would, how would someone place that in, in a landscape? And if you really look, it's completely random and, and it twists and it turns and it's wide and it's narrow and it's, you know, there's plant growing out of the way. And usually there's a big boulder that pushes the water aside, you know, cause I, when you say the word dry Creek, it's dry, but it's trying to be a Creek. And, exactly. And so what I do is when, when you start with something substantial and like a focal point, like a big, nice, big boulder turn it, you know, or walk around it and see which one's the best side, which one's the most colorful, which really, you know, kind of speaks to me. And, and if it has a kind of a peak, you know, coming up to the top, it's kind of cool because it kind of looks kind of like a mountainous, you know, and then have it be nice and wide there and then coming narrow. Maybe you're as wide as four or five, six feet and narrow down. Don't be afraid to come down to two foot, one foot in an area, put another boulder, you know, maybe eight, 10, 15 feet away and a nice big substantial boulder and have it like if the water was hitting that rock, it would turn the Creek. And I've seen that in nature where there's something's in the way and the water just turned, you know? And so that kind of like 
create that. And then if you wash, what washes out there is all the little rocks and little pebbles and things get washed right there. I think you're absolutely right. When I first started creating dry creeks, I remember looking at river maps of the United States and just looking at that and taking a look and nothing about that said structured. It was so volatile. Yeah. And it's kind of snake-like, but even that, you don't want to get too essy. You, you just want it to be random. You know, it's kind of funny. We've done that where we, I had a truck and we had boulders in the back of the truck and we were driving down and we were just toss one out and just toss another one out and toss a rock out and Okay, <laughs> that's it. I mean, it doesn't get any more random than that. It's like that expensive painting that the guy took two minutes and threw blotches of, of paint on a, on a paper and said, okay, let's call it good. Let's go make $15,000 on this you painting. Know, and you end up moving them a little bit and then turning them and kind of giving it your, you know, a little flair. But you want it to look random and Odd numbers, too. We always talk about that in plant material when we space plants out and stay with odd numbers and groupings and things. Nature has a tendency to group things together. So there'll be like a bunch of boulders all in one area, and then you dry it, and then there's none, you know, and then there's some a smaller outcropping, you know. And I don't know why, but that's just how it looks to me, and I try to simulate that, you know, in the landscape. I agree. Well, you know, you've had years of experience and trial and error, and I think that's all kind of brought you to where you are now as a designer. Yeah, well, it's been fun, and that's kind of reviewing, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the the groupings of the plants and the sizes and how big things are going to get. If you're driving around, and if you see a dry creek that you love, get out, stop the car, look at it, take some pictures of it, consider how it was done. If you see a plant that you're thinking about planting in your yard, keep an eye out for them in your neighborhood. Uh, hot lips, for instance, Jonathan and I, we love hot lips plants. A salvia, it's got, it's a white flower with red tips and it kind of looks like you put lipstick on it. And I've seen some full grown ones. We were just driving and solving the other day and I, we stopped the truck and I got out and said, look, here's a full grown hot lips. This is what they look like in full size here on the central coast. So I don't care what the book says or what the nursery guide tells you, this is it because this is real life. And so when you, even if you get a little small one in a four inch pot, you have to remember this going to be four feet high and four feet wide yeah. and plant it that way today. So be smart and do your homework and, you know, enjoy it out there. You've got dry creeks would be another great weekend project that you could, uh, you know, do yourself and have fun with. And, you know, if you mess it up, who cares? You can always, you know, do it again. Yeah, I agree. That's the great thing about landscaping. It's very forgiving. Uh, there's really no way to make a mistake, even if you were to overplant, say, in the garden too many plants. Uh, you know, like I earlier stated, I have the tendency to do that. Is you just take them out, and, or you know, you start cutting things back, and if they become too much maintenance, then you know that's kind of how you learn. And and it is gardening is a, is a series of trial and error. It's like building the rock wall we were talking about. Um, you know, you put a boulder in there and then you put the little cobblestone piece or that, you know, I take a step back that doesn't look right. Let me grab another boulder, put that in place, you know, and then when you finally get it, that look that you want and, and you keep going and the, and the gratif gratification that comes with that and the satisfaction, that's why I really, it, it's so fun to do this for a living and... We get to play in other people's yards and create those landscapes over and over and over again. And if you enjoy that, you're the type of person that's tuning into this show and getting motivated to get out there in your yard and fix things up, just do it with abandon. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Know that everything's repairable. There's no mistake you can make that you can redo or move. Even moving the plant sometimes we've, taken plants and they've gotten too big and, and if you can dig them up in time where they're still not too heavy or too large you can move things around you can always change that one little boulder or you know move it slightly one way or the other and that's what it's supposed to feel like it's just fun and a good time and you get an exercise and it's, hopefully it's a beautiful day and the weather and everything so thank you so much for tuning in we'll see you next week at the same time you can always catch us at 805-588-6917 or on the web at i love to come home.com this has been patio side chats with fernando martinez 
from Chaparral Pavers. Go to ilovetocomehome.com to find out more or call 805-588-6917. And be sure and tune in next week at this same time for Patio Side Chat here on KSMA.